How do people know that you're a Christian? I mean, what is it about your life that makes people just know? They see it. I've been thinking about this question a lot lately, especially in the midst of such difficult political and, and racial climate. How do people know that we're Christian? Paul's words in Philippians 4 really help frame this for me. Let's jump into verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. For Paul here, the people in Philippi are his crown, which is interesting language. You have to know sports imagery to really get what he's saying. Caesar Augustus was known for creating intense competitions, sporting events, if you will. Philippi, it was settled by the Romans, the city was, in the first century, and it was a place where these sporting events took place. If you go there today, you'll see ruins of an ancient gymnasium with a racetrack around an athletic field, even today. So Paul's using the language of the people. So let's run with this metaphor, pun intended. When an athlete wins a competition, they're crowned with a victor's wreath. These are the same wreaths that you would see in pictures of gods from centuries ago, like Apollo. It's a sign of victory or honor, and even more than that. In this moment of competition, your status is elevated to that of the gods. You just did something divine by winning a competition, and now you stand above the rest. Think of our Olympics. We crown the winners with a medal wreath. And even more fascinating, in biblical times, the victor isn't the only one who gets a wreath. So do the priests and the kings and the dignitaries of the winning people group. They also get a wreath. Here's why this matters. Athletes never win for just themselves. They win on behalf of their people, their tribe, their country. They represent the whole. They all become in that moment a mark of the divine. It's really similar to how the Olympics counts how many medals each, each country wins. You know, when Michael Phelps gets a gold medal in swimming, it's like we all get a gold medal in swimming. The whole is lifted above the rest. It's the same thing here in Philippians. Paul's using athletic imagery for a church whose city is well-versed in competition, saying that the Christ followers in Philippi are his crown. They are the winners of a competition, and they are like divinity for him. Paul's blessing the church and drawing on imagery that they are in a fight, perhaps a fight to the death, but they'll win as long as they can do what I'm going to read in just a moment. But first, a little bit more context. Verse 2. I urge Eudea and I urge Sintiq to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, Paul's addressing a concern here. There are two women, clearly in leadership roles. Now, this should put to bed any weird controversy today of women's role in the church, but if it doesn't, it's because people really haven't read deeply enough into the Bible, especially Philippians. But anyway, these two women in Philippi, they're at odds. Now, we don't really know why, but it's clear they have conflicting philosophical ideas. It's like one is a Democrat and the other's a Republican. And they've been working in the same church together for a long time. They've struggled beside one another, and they've been quite successful in the work of the gospel. They've both done great things, but they're at a philosophical impasse. You know, that's similar to today. There are people, leaders, in this church who are lifelong Republicans. I know, because you've told me. There are people, leaders, in this church who are lifelong Democrats. I know, you've told me. There are people, leaders 
in this church who voted for our current president. I know because you've told me. There are people, leaders in this church, who have already voted in this year's election for someone other than our current president. I know because you've told me. There are people, leaders in this church, who are lifelong Republicans, who are not voting Republican this year. I know you've told me. There are people, leaders in this church, who are lifelong Democrats, who are frustrated with this year's Democratic nominee. I know because you've told me. Now, I'm not going to ever say who you are. That's confidential between you and your pastor. But I'm saying all of this to say, the philosophical divide that existed in Philippians, well, it exists here 2,000 years later today. I don't know if their strife was political for them back then, but I can tell you, ours is. Politics has created an almost irreconcilable divide in America, and I feel its tension all the time. There are people who cannot speak to another on the other side of the aisle. The lines are too dark, too divided, too controversial. And yet people on both sides claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Both are doing the hard, co-laboring work of helping to make earth as it is in heaven. And this is apparently true for the church in Philippi with these two women leaders. So what would Paul tell them to do? Look at verses 4 and 5. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. In other words, find a way to make your connection with one another higher and more altruistic than your connections to what you are frustrated about. For the women in Philippi, this is that they should stay connected over worshiping and rejoicing together in the Lord. Worship and God's kingdom coming to earth is that higher calling, not their disagreements. For us as a church, should this be any different? We have to be people who serve a higher purpose than a love of politics or a love of just our country. We cannot be satisfied with making America alone more like our political ideologies. We have to be people who see how and to strive to make the world more divine, starting with us. The competition we are in is a battle for whether or not our souls will unite alongside one another to do the good, hard work of God? Or have we fractured ourselves so badly that no crown can be awarded to either side? It's a real quagmire that we must all wrestle with because we're all affected by this. And look what Paul says to the women in verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Gentleness here doesn't mean pushover or soft. Now the Revised Standard Version translates this word forbearance. This may be a better word. The context shows that these women have been in relationship for a long time. They're like an old married couple, and over decades you can grate on each other. But with forbearance, you hold your differences in love. You're gentle with those you have friction with because the friction is nowhere as close as important to the love you share. There's a higher connection that puts you together. There will never be a time when the church only has Republicans or the church only has Democrats. There will always be both, and Libertarians for that matter. Working to make everyone more like you is futile and the opposite of what Paul means by using the word gentle here. The competition is not won by becoming more political. The competition is won by becoming more like Christ. We must find a higher connection. We must see that our co-laboring doesn't bring politics to earth as it is in heaven, but rather our co-laboring brings love and peace and joy to earth as it is in heaven. And this is where it gets tricky and entangled 
I'm not suggesting you just dismiss your political opinions altogether. Who we vote for and the administration that's built around that candidate shapes the trajectory of our future laws and finances and military, etc. Elections have consequences. I'm not saying they don't. But there's also the mystical reality that there's something higher and more divine than elections that's going on right now in our world. And we have to be aware of that thing, too. And that's what makes me ask the question, how do people know that you're a Christian? I'm not sure they will if we don't forbear gentleness towards the other. I think we could talk about this subject for hours, and I think we probably should. Now, sermons are meant to elicit a response, so go and talk about and respond with one another that you love, even those that you love and disagree with. Ask yourself and others, how do people know that we're Christian? I'll tell you, if joy and gentleness don't bubble up into your conversation, then you're getting it wrong. We have to be people of joy and gentleness. We have to be. Otherwise, we don't win any competition that moves the world closer to the divine. Our crowning achievement may just be that we can show the world that even in an election year, politics won't divide us. Something bigger unites us, and that is the peace and the love of God.